Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining again today as we come together uh, to hear from God's Word. You know, Karenport is a pretty pretty academic kind of community, so I thought this meme might be uh, appropriate and might resonate with some of you. Maybe you've seen it. Uh, different, Slightly different versions out there, but the gist of it is, what's it like being a teacher during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, you remember in Titanic when the band kept playing while the ship went down, dot, dot, dot. Now, this is kind of gallows humor, I guess, but I suspect we've all felt that at some point in these last weeks, months, right? Is what I'm, go- is what I'm doing even going to matter in, in six months from now? Will there be jobs to go back to? Will there be a, a, a church as we know it to go back to? Will there be a school? Will there be schools of any sort to go back to? Will there be life to go back to? If you're like me, you're probably sick and tired of hearing about new normal, as though the kind of uh, restrictions that some people think we should just make indefinite or permanent uh, could be anything like normal. Uh, They're not. That's not a normal way to live. But we wonder, don't we, whether whether our actions are accomplishing anything. Uh, I know I certainly have at different points. Uh, You know, when, when the day is hard or the week is hard, you wonder, are you just playing nearer my God to thee while the the Titanic's deck tilts beneath your chairs. Now, that's kind of not very cheery stuff for a Sunday morning, but that's kind of where Jeremiah finds himself in our text for today. He has an action uh, from the Lord that he's supposed to do that I imagine to him felt uh, pretty futile as well, given the circumstances that he's facing. But as the Lord does, he had a purpose and a point even in the midst of that. Now, rather than read this, this scripture uh, all in one chunk. It's pretty long. And I want to read the whole chapter because I think that's important uh, to really understand all that's going on here. Uh, but the whole chapter is pretty long. So I'm just going to read a section at a time and then uh, draw out some points from that. And then we'll move on to the next rather than reading the whole thing at the very beginning and then uh, then finding that you maybe can't remember it all uh, later on. So uh, Jeremiah chapter 32 Jeremiah 32, and again, I'll read just the first section, and then we'll talk about that a little bit. Jeremiah 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall certainly be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And he shall take Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall remain until I visit him, declares the Lord. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anatoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field that is in Anatoth, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anatoth from Hanamel my cousin and weighed out the money to him, seventeen shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase, containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of Hanamel my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses, who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. I charged Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware vessel, that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Now, at this point, we've pretty much made it 
to the end of the story. Even if uh, the end of the book is still a ways away, there's quite a number of chapters left, uh, but the story is, is really nearing its end for Jeremiah and, uh, and the people of Jerusalem. The city is under siege. You know, we're in the last year or so of uh, Jerusalem's time, and uh, things, are looking, things are looking pretty grim. It may not be the, the final worst deprivation, but people are definitely, definitely going hungry. Um, things are bad. Uh, the, the king and the other leaders have gotten so sick of Jeremiah that they've, uh, they've put him in prison just because they're sick of his preaching, sick of him saying that uh, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar is going to take the city. And there he is in prison, and he gets this, this visit uh, from his cousin Hanamel that the Lord has actually warned him about. Now, what probably happens here, because uh, you're wondering, well, how did his cousin come from another town to see him if the city's under siege, right? Well, uh, we know from history that there was a brief lull in the siege of Jerusalem when uh, the Egyptians put up some resistance to the Babylonians, and the Babylonians had to uh, move some of their forces to go deal with the, the threat from the Egyptians and put that down. And that put a bit of a lull in the siege. And so that's probably when this, when this story happens, when Hanamel comes, he, you know, has an opportunity uh, to get through as the siege is relaxed a bit. And it makes sense because that would also be an opportunity. If he could convert uh, his land into some ready cash, then he'd be able to buy provisions for when the siege inevitably gets worse again. Now, this is a bit complicated, but there's some background in the Mosaic Law that explains what's happening in this passage. Essentially, it comes down to this. Land in ancient Israel was supposed to stay within the family uh, as close as possible, or at least you know, within the extended family or clan. Leviticus 25 says, If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. If a man has no one to redeem it, and then himself becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means to redeem it, let him calculate the years since he sold it and pay back the balance to the man to whom he sold it and then return to his property. But if he does not have sufficient means to recover it, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee it shall be released, and he shall return to his property. So right, there's the scenario of of a man who is poor or in great financial distress, perhaps he has debts and he needs to sell some of his land. Now, presumably, before it even came to selling the land outside of uh, the family, outside of the clan, uh, it would there'd be an obligation on close relatives to purchase that land and relieve uh, their unfortunate relative so that he didn't have to sell the land outside of the clan. There'd be that kind of an obligation there. Now, if, if a family member uh, could not come forward at that time, he might have to go through with selling the land to a stranger. And then one of three things would happen. Uh, either he would uh, do well enough eventually that he could buy back his land, or maybe they could find some other family member that they weren't able to find before who could come forward and buy the land. Or three, it would revert back to him at the year of Jubilee every 50 years uh, when land you know, went back to the families who originally owned it. All that to say, there was a very strong sense in ancient Israel that land should stay within the family and that extended family members had, well here it's called a right of redemption, but it's probably a polite way of saying an obligation to redeem that land. It was very important in their society. And it's this obligation that Jeremiah's cousin Hanamel is kind of pointing out here, and again, saying that you have the right to redeem this land is, is probably a little bit more uh, the sense of, you know, you, you kind of have to do this for me. He prevails upon Jeremiah to buy the family farm uh, back at Anatoth. We don't exactly know what the circumstances were, whether Hanamel just was uh, in need of buying some provisions because, you know, the, the siege was bad, the food was scarce, uh, maybe he, he had racked up debts trying to stay alive and needed to pay them off. It is pretty clear though that he was desperate to sell this land. The price was pretty low, just 17 shekels of silver, which would tell us that he was desperate to just get rid of it for anything that he could. Here's the thing, low price or not, this is a terrible idea 
for Jeremiah. Chances are, I mean, chances are the Babylonian army is camping on that piece of land as this happens. Or if they're not, they will return shortly and set up shop there once again. Jeremiah is in jail, remember, and he's an old man by this point. And on top of that, if that wasn't enough to convince him he was never actually going to live at that farm, the Lord has revealed to him that Jerusalem's going to fall. Everybody's either going to be killed or go into exile in Babylon. He's never going to see that farm, let alone take possession of it and farm the land. From a human perspective, uh, this really is basically just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. It doesn't matter who owns that land from a, from a commerce point of view. And remember, Jeremiah is a single man. He doesn't even have kids who might have a hope of someday owning that land. No, it's, it's really a pretty hopeless endeavor at this point for Jeremiah. But here's the thing, the crazy thing. He actually does it. I mean, the Lord has to warn him ahead of time because this is so crazy, but he does go through with it when push comes to shove. And, you know, I think that really speaks to the kind of faith he had. Because by this point, I would have been, and I don't know how your week has been, but my week has been such that I think I would have been like, you know what, Lord? No, I'm not going to buy this land. You put me here and nobody has listened to my messages. You gave me, people have persecuted me, we're all starving and I'm in jail. So no, I'm not going to buy this land from Hanamel. But Jeremiah was not me. Jeremiah was a man of tremendous, tremendous faith. And the kind of hardships he endured, which I think would have just beaten most people down, seemed to have made him stronger over time. Now, he and God do have to have an intense conversation about this afterward, and we'll get into that shortly. But he actually goes through with it. He actually buys this plot of land from his cousin, makes it all legal. I mean, he's very intentional about that. It's, it's not just like they kind of spit on their hands and shake on it or something and, you know, pull the, the brown paper envelope out from the jacket pocket out in the back alley. Like this is all above board and legal and documented. He takes great pains to make sure that this is all done legally. Uh, there's a witness, there's a deed of sale actually too. There's an open deed and there's a sealed deed that's put away in case it ever needs to be consulted in the future, right? It'd be sealed up so that uh, there'd be proof that it hadn't ever been tampered with. It's stored in a clay jar, so it'll be safe. I mean, we might think it'd be better off in a, in a safe deposit box, in a bank, but uh, in the ancient world, this is how they did it, and it actually worked pretty well. Uh, that's how the Dead Sea Scrolls were stored, and in a dry climate like that, uh, they can last for, for centuries, actually. So this would have worked pretty well. It probably would have preserved it for a long time. A great deal of intentionality in all of this. And, and this will be important as we go along. But once the deed is done and signed, and Hanamel has departed with his 17 shekels of silver, Jeremiah does need to have a visit with God. So uh, pull out your Bibles again. We'll look at verse 16 of Jeremiah chapter 32. And we'll read a little further along here. <clears throat> this is the beginning of Jeremiah's conversation with the Lord. This is, this is his, his half of the conversation. After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the children of man, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. You have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt and to this day in Israel and among all mankind, and have made a name for yourself as at this day. You brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders with a strong hand and outstretched arm, and with great terror. And you gave them this land which you swore to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they entered and took possession of it. But they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They did nothing 
of all you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have made all this disaster come upon them. Behold, the siege mounds have come up to the city to take it, and because of sword and famine and pestilence, the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you spoke has come to pass, and behold, you see it. Yet you, O Lord God, have said to me, Buy the field for money and get witnesses, though the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. I mentioned already that Jeremiah has great faith. Again, I think if it was me, I would have just skipped to the last part of, of that conversation with God. I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, God, the, in case you hadn't noticed, the city is under a siege here and we're all likely to die. And you just had me spend the last money I had to buy a farm from my deadbeat cousin Hanamel, and I'm never going to live there. What gives? But Jeremiah does not do this. He sees the bigger picture. He sees how God has been active in both creation broadly and his covenant with his people specifically. Did you see that? He, he talks about God's power in, in creating and, and upholding the world. He talks about God's mighty acts on behalf of his people to bring them out of slavery in Egypt. And he talks about God's provision in giving his people the land. But ultimately, Jeremiah has to also talk about God's justice in punishing his people for their sins, their waywardness, their hard-heartedness, their rebellion, their breaking God's covenant. And only then, after he rehearses all of this, does he end with, you know, what's the point of me having this piece of land now, God? Again, I think it speaks mightily of Jeremiah's faith at this point. He doesn't say, notice, he, he, he never questions, why am I suffering all of this too, God? I, I've been actually faithful to you, and all these other people haven't, and yet I seem to be suffering the same fate as them. Um, he doesn't spend any time really feeling sorry for himself or any of that. Uh, he's just really confused about this, this whole thing with this land. And you know, the Lord answers him. Uh, it just, like it took Jeremiah a little while to get to his question, it takes the Lord a little while uh, to get to his answer too. So let's, let's pick back up again. Uh, verse 26, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am giving this city into the hands of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. The Chaldeans who are fighting against this city shall come and set this city on fire and burn it with the houses on whose roofs offerings have been made to Baal, and drink offerings have been poured out to other gods to provoke me to anger. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. The children of Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the work of their hands, declares the Lord. This city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day, so that I will remove it from my sight because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah that they did to provoke me to anger, their kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned to me their back and not their face. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. They set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it. They built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech, though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. The Lord doesn't actually provide Jeremiah yet uh, with, with any answers he, he, he hasn't really thought of on his own at this point. It's kind of like he's saying, well, Jeremiah... Sounds like you've actually figured out uh, the answer to most of your questions on your own already. All he really does at this point is expand on and affirm Jeremiah's assessment of the situation. Yes, Judah has broken faith with God. They've stubbornly rebelled, right? It says they turned their back to me rather than their face. And uh, he also affirms that you know the, the city will indeed fall soon and that, in fact, this is, this is justified. 
that's the thing when a challenging thing like this happens and i'm i'm sure this is something they would have wrestled with too it doesn't mean that god has lost control and i think that's what this whole section really emphasizes right it would be easy to be like everything's gone terrible things are just falling apart how did it ever come to this god can't be in control can he and and god affirms that you know even though i sent prophets to teach them and they had my law they stubbornly refused to obey it um, so god is bringing his his just punishment for the people's sins so that's the bad news and Jeremiah has been filled with a lot of bad news, but there's also, well, we'll see. Verse, uh, verse 36 now to the end of the chapter. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, <clears throat> by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger, and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place, and I will make them dwell in safety, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. For thus says the Lord, Just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. Fields shall be bought in this land of which you are saying, It is a desolation without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Fields shall be bought for money, and deeds shall be signed and sealed and witnessed in the land of Benjamin, in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the Shephelah, and in the cities of the Negev. For I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. Okay, so here's the thing. This, this shift is completely bizarre. Like, it, is, it is bonkers. All the commentators point out that there is no logic here. And the thing they point to specifically is that verse 36 begins with the words, now, therefore, now, therefore. But there's precisely zero reason why what has just followed or what has just preceded this, sorry, uh, that anything that comes after should follow, right? Verse 35 talks about, the Israelites getting so wicked that they offered human sacrifices of their own children to the god Molech. And then verse 36, uh, Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, I, I'm going to regather these people and, and bless them. That, that just does not follow in any way, shape, or form. None whatsoever. Some translations are even reluctant to use the, the therefore conjunction, though it's there in the Hebrew, and they try to smooth it out because it just seems so strange. And while that might seem less awkward, I think it's about a thousand percent to miss the point because what they're doing there is trying to make God's ways seem somewhat logical and make sense to us precisely at the point when he's being most scandalous in his grace. Why am I making such a big deal of this? Why is it so important that these two sections be joined with this this therefore, rather than, you know, but rather, or something of that nature. Here's why. We don't serve a God who is, you know, I, I use these terms carefully, but, but bipolar or schizophrenic or something, where, where, you know, he just has these violent swings in his character, such that you never know whether you're going to get the, the, the nice, the nice, kind, loving, grandfatherly God, or just the mean judgmental punishing one right where you know there's this like war going on inside of him and and there's these areas of his character that are that are constantly constantly fighting each other or something like that or where you know he doesn't even know who he is and himself because it's so so strange here god's mercy and his judgment might seem opposite to us or at odds with within him from our point of view 
They might make no sense to us, but right, that's, that's why I think the therefore is so important. Um, in, in God's view of things, this is consistent with who he is, even though it doesn't seem to make any logical sense to us. And that consistency, though it makes no sense to us, is entirely dependent on, on his grace that we call amazing. And maybe we should be even more willing to call scandalous, right? These people wickedly disobeyed him, and he turns right around and says, but there's still blessing to come for them. The worst of Israel's sins, even though God has to punish them, also become the context for him to show the best of his grace. That's where, where he ends, and finally Jeremiah's answer comes. Jeremiah's buying of this field, though he'll never see it or farm it, is like many things that he did, an object lesson in the character and the ways of God. Despite how bad things look now, and they're very bad, despite Israel's persistent sin, their complete stubborn hard-heartedness to, to follow God, to repent, Despite the imminent destruction of their city, their temple, their society, all that they know, God is not done with them. He will still be gracious to them for no other reason than that's who he is in himself. He will still be true to his covenant. He will bring them back. On the other side of this punishment, on the other side of this exile, life will resume Blessing will come, flourishing will happen. My original plan was to at least do a couple more weeks on Jeremiah, but as I've prayed about this, this, this seems to be a, a good stopping point. Uh, we've come full circle, in a way, from where we started in chapter 29. There, uh, we looked at Jeremiah's letter to those already in exile, encouraging them to make the most of life in Babylon, to trust God, and to trust him specifically that one day he would restore their fortunes, even if most of the people alive at that time wouldn't live long enough to see it because the exile was going to take 70 years to run its course. In this passage, the, uh, that same idea becomes personal for Jeremiah, right? He's asked to trust the Lord, uh, that the Lord will still bring this blessing even though he himself will not be alive to see it. As I've said, he's never going to take possession of that farm. But buying this is an act of hope that, you know what, the Babylonian army is not always going to be camping on that land. It, the land is not always going to be overrun by a hostile foreign power. There's coming a time when some future generation of Israelites, of God's people, are going to come back and they will live on that land. And someday, that deed that he put in a clay pot somewhere, someone's going to find that and they're going to be reminded of God's faithfulness. When he puts that sealed deed of sale into safekeeping in that clay pot, it's a sort of seed of hope that a future generation will have a reminder of the faithfulness of God. Here's the thing that I hope we take from our time with Jeremiah. The scope of, of what it looks like for God to bless his people is much, much, much bigger than how we would often imagine or, or if we're honest, want it to work. A couple things I'd like to leave with us is, as we move toward closing. First of all, we would prefer God's blessings to function primarily on an individual basis. We'd like it best if God's blessings were primarily about us, about me and my enjoyment. Now, there are some out there, sadly, who teach that this is the way it actually works, but that's not true and that's not what we see in Scripture. Sometimes, yes, God does bless us individually, uh, materially, with success. But, you know, who is it that's always, always most faithful? when those kind of blessings come and what do they do with it? Well, it's always the humble people uh, that are most faithful and they use those, those blessings when they do come as a way to in turn bless others and, and support the advancement of God's kingdom, right? Secondly, 
we would prefer if God's blessings were immediate, right? I want what I want from God and I want it now. And that's not often the case either. Much as we are, uh, you know, preoccupied with a pretty short time span and impatient. As God's people, we are always, and we've always had to be, about passing on what we've been given and investing it in the future and the next generations. Why else would would elderly uh, saints who have very little time left to live on this earth take the resources they have and, and give them Uh, to their local church, to a summer camp, to a school like Briarcrest? Well, it's because they have faith and believe that in doing this, it will enable the next generation to be trained up and discipled in the faith, right? It's not about them. It's about what God's going to do and the fruit he's going to bear in those lives years to come, even, even generations to come. Essentially, they're doing what Jeremiah was doing, uh, investing money, resources, whatever, prayer, in something they're, they'll never live to see, but which will bear fruit in and for future generations. You know, these kinds of, of hope and trust, planting these sorts of seeds, they're not just playing nearer my God to thee while the Titanic slowly sinks, no matter how uncertain of a time we're living in. Sometimes we don't really realize what faith actually is until we get to a point where we realize how little control we actually had. I mean, we never had control over what was going to happen in future generations. Truthfully, we didn't even ever have control about what's going to happen now. Sometimes it just takes uh, challenging circumstances we can't ignore anymore to remind us of that fact. And when we're reminded of that, hopefully, we realize that, you know what? Trusting God to bring about his good purposes beyond what we can achieve or even what we'll be around for. That was never some sort of plan B that we could you know, try as a, as a desperate last resort when everything else failed. That's the way things always have been. That's the way they always have to be. That's the way they always will be. I would encourage us all to find some of these areas where we can plant some seeds of hope even when things around us don't make a lot of sense. Dochelle and I did that recently. As many of you know, we've, we've been working for some time now on an international adoption, and it's been slow. Working with government bureaucracy in, in a developing country like, like Haiti, that's a slow process. And uh, I know uh, in these recent days, we've seen riots breaking out in cities uh, across the United States in particular, but in other places too. Uh, but that's, that's a pretty normal thing in Haiti, actually, and that there, the last year or so has been one of intense civil unrest. That slowed the process for us down even more. And then, unfortunately, COVID came along and just ground everything pretty much to a halt. So we don't know how long it's going to be. We're still waiting to be matched with a little boy or girl, and that wait just got notably longer as far as we can tell. Obviously, it's tempting to be discouraged, to wonder if it will ever come to pass. And we've had our moments. But one thing we did this week, and it's kind of a small thing in, in the grand scheme of things, but one thing we did this week uh, was to order a few new toys and books uh, to prepare our home for our little one when, when he or she arrives. We'll set those aside for the future. Kind of like Jeremiah setting aside that deed in that... Oh, okay, I didn't quite set them all aside for the future. I I had quite a bit of fun playing with the little wooden toy train, if if I'm completely honest. Uh, But I look forward to uh, not just having to do that by myself at some point in the future. Now, it's a small thing. uh, But you know what? It didn't actually make a lot of sense in the present climate we're living in. It would have made more sense to just wait and see how things turn out. But for us, it was an important way to to plant a little seed of hope in God's future to do something that signified to ourselves as much as anything, but that signified 
we're, we're continuing to trust God in this, even though it doesn't make a great deal of sense. And by His grace, it wasn't just a futile attempt at playing some music to distract ourselves while the ship went down. It was a way that we can stake our claim on the fact that God is faithful and that what He's promised and, and what He's called us to will come to pass in His own good time. And we continue to trust Him for that. So I would encourage you to find something this week uh, to, in which you can plant some seeds of hope and trust in what God is doing, even in a time that's uncertain, even in a time when it doesn't make sense to do so, even in a time when it maybe just makes more sense to wait and see, to hunker down until everything all blows over. You know, um, invest in kingdom work of some sort even if it doesn't make a lot of sense to do so right now, you know, from a strictly uh, fiscal or, or economic perspective. Bless someone this week, even if you're not going to receive any credit for it. Build up someone younger than you are, who, who will impact the future uh, for the Lord and for his kingdom, and, and whose life and, and potential ministry could be bearing fruit long after your time on this earth has come to an end. And when you do that, you know, do something tangible to, to mark that as well. Maybe you want to write that down, put it on a calendar or something so that you'll, you'll be reminded of it in the future. And in that way, you can make it a sign to yourself and maybe at some point to others as well of trust in the goodness of God and the graciousness of God and the faithfulness of God, right? A sign that reminds you that he's trustworthy, that what he's promised he will bring to pass, that he will bless, and that there will come a future with flourishing under him. Amen.